Hello everyone. Today I'll talk about our paper Good Copy and Patch Compilation. Many modern applications require compilation at runtime, and the examples include database engine which compiles SQL query to machine code, and the browsers which compile WebAssembly modules to machine code, and many more. Since the delay experienced by the user is the sum of the compilation time and the execution time, a traditional very optimizing but very slow compiler is not enough. As an example, LVM03 takes 4.5 seconds to compile a TBCH database query in a commercial database, and uh, Google Chrome can take 49 seconds to compile the module powering the AutoCAD online app. So we need a fast compiler to get started quickly. That's why the industrial databases and browsers employ a two-tier st strategy, and uh, Tier 1 is a fast compiler, and uh, Tier 2 is a slow optimizing compiler. So for databases, the standard approach for Tier 1 is either an interpreter or LVM 0 The advantage is that the amount of engineering work needed is small, since LVM 0 does not require additional work. Since if we already have LVM 3 then it's just changing an option flag, and the interpreter is needed for testing anyway. However, the disadvantage is also clear. Uh, an interpreter is too slow at execution, and the, the startup delay of LVM 0 is unfortunately still very high, uh, since LVM is an optimizing compiler. So despite that we are not cooling the optimization passes, LVM is still not designed to generate code that fast. For WebAssembly, it turns out that the standard approach employed by both browsers and the non-web runtimes for Tier 1 compiler is to have a dedicated baseline compiler. A baseline compiler only scans through the WebAssembly bytecode once, and uh, as it scans through the bytecode, it determines what machine instruction it wants to emit, and uh, emits the instruction using a platform-dependent assembler. The advantage of this approach is that the startup delay is much lower than LVM 0 However, the disadvantage of this approach is that it only works for low-level bytecode, so no databases employ this approach as fast as we know and also the amount of engineering work is really high. Our solution to this problem is copy and patch. Copy and patch is a compilation technique that can be used for both high-level language compilation, for example for databases, and for low-level bytecode assembly, such as for WebAssembly. And our technique achieves both much lower startup delay and much better execution performance than both LVM 0 and the dedicated baseline compilers. To evaluate our approach, we build a WebAssembly baseline compiler that fully supports the 1.0 specification, as well as the SQL database query compiler prototype that is capable of running the TPCH queries. And uh, this figure shows our results. So for WebAssembly, we compile our compiler with Google Chrome's liftoff baseline compiler and the TurboFan optimizing compiler on four benchmarks. So as you can see, compared with the liftoff baseline compiler, our compilation time is 4.9 to 6.5 times faster, and our execution time is 39% to 63% faster. And uh, compared with the TurboFan optimizing compilers, on small modules, our compilation time is 30 to 47 times faster, and on large modules, our compilation time is about 90 times faster, and uh, our execution time is only 15% to 31% slower. And uh, for our SQL database query compiler, on TPCH queries, uh, compared with LVM 0 our compilation time is two orders of magnitude faster, and uh, our execution time is also 2% to 57% faster. And uh, compared with LVM 01 our compilation time is three orders of magnitude faster, and uh, our execution time is from 4% slower to 39% slower. And uh, compared with the interpreter, an interpreter has a startup delay of 2 to 3 times lower than us. However, both costs are negligible because it turns out that it takes longer to construct a SD tree. Uh, however, our execution performance is from 6 times to 27 times better. Uh, for a more intuitive view, we also plotted the palatal frontier for some of the benchmarks. As you can see, on WebAssembly, our compiler displaced all baseline compilers, as well as one relatively slow optimizing compiler of the palatal frontier. And uh, on the SQL database query compiler use case, our technique renders both interpreter and the LVM 0 obsolete. LVM 01 or higher optimization level is still useful, 
but they come at a three orders of magnitude higher startup delay. So the cases that they are used for becomes narrower. So how does our approach work? The core idea is that we have a code library that is built at the application build time. So at build time, we build a library of composable and uh, configurable code snippets, which we call binary stencils, that implements different language constructs. And uh, at runtime, we select the desired snippets and uh, compose them together by copying them to continuous memory, and uh, finally configuring them by patching the missing values. And there are many different variants that perform the same functionality. So we do optimization by selecting the different variants, as we will cover later. The architecture is shown in the figure below. So we have the stencil generators, which are just ordinary C++ template functions. And uh, at build time, a special compiler uh, pre-processes these uh, stencil generators and uh, generates a stencil library. And uh, this stencil library gets linked together with the main application. And uh, at runtime, the copy and patch algorithm selects stencils from the stencil library based on the runtime known as T and uh, compose them together and patch in missing values to produce executable code. So why does our algorithm generate code fast? The reason is that with our code library approach, the heavy lifting of generating binary code has been shifted to application build time. And uh, at runtime, all we are doing is to select the stencil by looking up a data table and uh, copying the stencil to the destination address by a memory copy, and uh, to do a few Scala additions to patch in the missing values. At runtime, the algorithm does not know or care about the machine instructions that is being generated, the encoding of the instruction, the encoding of the registers, or anything. Everything has just become data that we have pre-built at build time. As an example, in our WebAssembly compiler, with the exception of a few special opcodes, we don't even need a switch case on the opcode, since everything has become data. So we are going through the same code path to generate an addition, a subtraction, a comparison, or things like those. Only the stencil data that we select is different, and uh, the code path is the same. And uh, how can our technique also generate fast code? The reason is the Pareto Principle, also known as the Rule of 2080, which states that 80% of the consequences comes from 20% of the cause. And in the world of compiler optimization for static type languages, it turns out that 80% of the performance gain comes from only two optimizations. And the two optimizations are called register allocation and the instruction selection. Our stencil framework is designed to support those two optimizations through a concept which we call stencil variants. And the patch phase allows us to burn all kinds of constant literals such as stack offsets and jump addresses into the generated code, just like an optimizing compiler. And uh, through clever use of continuation passing style, we can eliminate unnecessary dispatch branches between stencils, so our control flow does not contain unnecessary jumps. And we support the two most important optimizations, which are register allocation and the instruction selection. Of course, we cannot do as well as a real optimizing compiler do, but that's good enough for our use case. So as a result, on average, we are only about 24% slower than LVM03 for TPCH use case. So in the rest of the presentation, I will try to give you some high-level ideas on how some of the important technical challenges are solved. Let's first introduce the concept of a stencil. It's easy to think of a stencil as an analog to a C++ templated function. As an example, the templated function below adds an input value x by a fixed constant y, and then calls a fixed function g to pass over the results. A stencil is analogous to a templated function above, except that its template parameters can be specified at runtime, and the instantiating such a template is extremely fast, and the filling the holes to get executable code from a stencil is analogous to instantiating the template by specifying its template parameter. So here comes the first technical challenge. How can we get functions with holes? And uh, it turns out that the core of the trick is pretty easy. So consider the following function. Uh, it's a function called evaluate, and uh, there are two extern definitions called evaluate LHS and uh, evaluate RHS. And uh, what evaluate do is it just calls evaluate LHS and uh, evaluate RHS and uh, add them together. So when we compile this code, the CPP compiler is going to generate an object for us. 
And the key observation is that the linker can link this object file to any definition of evaluate LHS and the evaluate RHS, and the generated executable is going to just work fine. So the object file must contain structured information to tell the linker how to wire the two coolies to its actual definitions. And the technical term for this wiring process is called symbol relocation. So if we pass the symbol relocation records of the object file, then we can act as a linker ourselves and the wire evaluate LHS and the evaluate RHS to any function of our choice. It turns out that the cost is only a copy to make a copy of the binary code followed by a few 32 or 64 bit Scala addition to modify the binary code at a few predetermined places according to the symbol relocation records. So it's pretty cheap. So by cleverly leveraging the external function mechanism, we can generate functions that contains holes. Another issue is that in the above example, the control flow we generate is really bad. The two evaluate RHS and the evaluate RHS are function cores, so they are turned into core instructions. An optimizing compiler will not emit the two cores. In fact, it's not going to even emit any branches to compute this addition expression. So can we do that as well? It turns out that we can do that by cleverly leveraging the continuation passing style and the, the tail cool optimization. And the, due to time constraints, I will not cover it in detail. So the external function trick allows us to specialize a function and uh, inject values for branch targets at runtime. But can we inject any constant in general? It turns out that it's possible with a similar trick. The address of a symbol gives us 64 bits of zeros and ones, and uh, we can use it to represent a constant of a given type. So now let's take a look at how we implemented some optimizations. Recall that we need register allocation for performance. And uh, since a stencil is just an ordinary C++ function, inside the stencil, thanks to clown, we already automatically get these optimizations. But the problem is, how can we pass values in CPU register between stencils? It turns out that we can solve this problem by cleverly leveraging the function prototype and the cooling convention. So we need to generate many variants of stencil and the one for each register configuration. And uh, similarly, due to time constraint, see paper for detail. And uh, another optimization that we want is instruction selection. Similarly, thanks to clown, since every stencil is just an ordinary C++ function, uh, instruction selection is already good inside the stencil. But can we get better instruction selection across stencils? The solution we use is to simply enumerate common combinations of stencils. It is similar to the super instruction optimization in interpreters. So we get another kind of variant, which are super stencils that represent a common combination of stencils. It's worth noting that we support systematically generating such variants, so we can easily generate a lot of variants. It turns out that most of the code library size comes from those super stencils, but we stress that it's an optional optimization, so one can choose to not include super stencils for a small code library if that's desirable. And uh, for our high-level language design for database use case, it contains almost 100,000 different stencil variants, taking 17 megabytes of memory. And uh, for the WebAssembly compiler use case, since one might prefer a smaller static memory footprint in this use case, we did not use super stencil. And uh, it turns out that the code library is only 35 kilobyte big. So now let's move to the last technical challenge that we will discuss. Now we have so many variants but how can we generate them? The solution that we reached is to piggyback on C++'s strong template metaprogramming capability to systematically generate all the stencils. So each stencil generator will be a C++ templated function, and the each valid template parameter configuration will produce a stencil. And uh, at the time we build the stencil library at application build time, we would iterate the configuration space to generate all the stencil variants. All the valid stencil variants are then put into a stencil hash table with the template parameter configuration as the key. So at runtime, in order to select a stencil variant corresponding to a certain configuration, all we need to do is to query the hash table using the configuration as the key. So as a result, we get a very flexible system to systematically generate all the stencils. And uh, due to time constraints, I will not go into details here. 
please take a look at the paper for technical details. So that's it. Thanks for your attention.